Deep in the heart of Wichita, Kansas, lies the most powerful oil dynasty in America, and no, it's not the Rockefellers. This family's business makes twice what Coca-Cola makes, or around $125 million a year. They're the second largest privately owned company in America. And the current patriarch of the family? He ranks as the 22nd richest person in the world. This family operates oil refineries in Alaska, Texas, Minnesota, and other states. That means they control 4,000 miles of pipeline, longer than the United States itself. They built oil refineries for Joseph Stalin, Hitler, they fought for Qatar, and being how much America loves his oil, you can bet that this means they have a lot of political sway in American politics. And indeed they do. This family ranked as the 15th largest donor in the 2022 election cycle, while also ranking as the 26th biggest lobbyist in America. They are not shy about using their wealth to mold America to their heart's desire. But it's not just oil and politics. You probably have some of their products in your home right now as we speak. If you've ever worn a Lycra product, cleaned up with a brownie paper towel, stood on a stained master carpet or drunk from a Dixie cup, you have used their products. And yet most of you have probably never heard of their name, and if you have, you probably don't know anything about them. And for good reason. They don't like giving interviews, they definitely don't do social media, which seems pretty logical. Because if you have interest in oil wars and you're supporting overseas dictators, you would probably want to stay out of the limelight as well. Who is this powerful family, you ask? Well, move aside, Rockefeller, because it's none other than the Koch family, the most powerful oil dynasty in America today. The Koch family has a lot of different skills. The oil business, the paper business, marketing, and much more. In fact, if you look at a lot of the people you look up to, you'll find that most of them are good at many different skills, which is why you should always be learning. And a great place to learn new skills is Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes ranging from AI to entrepreneurship to storytelling and digital arts. For example, Ali Abdel's class Productivity for Creators was very helpful for a person in my position, and his lesson on productive procrastination blew my mind. But Skillshare isn't just for content creators or productivity hackers. It's for anyone who likes to learn new things. You can discover classes for something as specific as 3D illustration for interior design, as well as lessons on something as broad as how to make friends. There's over 200 classes on side hustles and making money online. And the best part is that you can start risk-free with the link below. The first 500 people to use my link will get a one-month free trial of Skillshare. So pause the video and click the link below now, and thanks to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Coach Harry Koch was a Dutch immigrant born in 1867 that moved to America at the age of 21. And Harry Koch was a very entrepreneurial man. By the time he moved to a small town in Texas called Kwana, he spent his time saving enough money to buy a local newspaper that would turn into the Kwana Tribune chief. But he didn't stop there. He would then get into the railroad business, starting the Kwana Acme and Pacific Railway Company as well. So with the newspaper and railroad business in hand, he would use the newspaper to promote his railroad, and he would also use the newspaper to spread his libertarian political beliefs. He would use the paper to criticize social security, he would trash unions, and be very pro-business. And this would be the humble beginnings of his family's foray into politics. It will also be the humble beginnings of what would become known as Coke Industries. Harry wanted to turn his little town of Quana into the most important railroad center in that part of Texas. He wanted to turn it into a major metropolitan area. But unfortunately, he would never quite achieve that dream. But he sure did make a whole lot of money in the process. He would pass the reins over to his son, Fred Koch. And Fred also shared his father's ambition. And he would take Koch Industries to a whole nother level. It was the oil boom in Texas at the time. So Fred over here decided to expand his father's business into oil. He ended up allegedly copying an oil refining process that was recently invented by a company called Universal Products, and he quickly started making bank off of it. He started installing his copycat refinery products all over the Midwest, and business was booming. Until Universal Products sued him in 1929 for copyright infringement. Suddenly, Fred's business was in jeopardy. He needed to find a way to keep making money. So he thought to himself, hmm, American copyright laws are just that, American. Other far-off countries aren't going to care if they're breaking American intellectual property laws. So to continue making money, all he would need to do is find people in other countries in need of his oil refining services that also don't care about US laws. Hmm, people like dictators. So Fred decided to head off to the Soviet Union to help out who do you know, Joseph Stalin. Yes, Fred went to the Soviet Union to help out Joseph Stalin set up 15 oil refineries in the 1930s, before World War II. And it worked. 
the oil refineries were a success, and Stalin paid him millions. But Stalin also wound up imprisoning and executing some of Fred's Soviet co-workers, which obviously wasn't ideal. Way to show gratitude, Stalin. So Fred bucked it out of the Soviet Union, and it left him with a deep hatred for communism. So since the Soviet Union wasn't an option anymore, he went to the next logical customer, Hitler. Yes, a few years later, Fred would go to Germany to build oil refineries for Adolf Hitler. Fred wasn't a Nazi, but he was a capitalist. And Adolf's money was as good as anyone else's. Check out our private documentary on whether or not Hitler actually killed himself by clicking the card on the top right corner. In the end, Fred came back from Europe as a very rich man. And he proceeded to do what any man would do after getting rich selling oil refineries to homicidal maniacs. He got married and started a family. Fred met his wife Mary in a 1930s polo match. He then built a massive mansion near the Wichita Country Club in Kansas, and he quickly started having sons. These sons, the third generation of the Koch dynasty, would go on to grow his empire into what it is today. There were four sons in total, Frederick, Charles, and two twins, David and Bill. And this was not an easy household to grow up in. They lived under super strict rules. In fact, David and Bill were often encouraged to duke it out with each other when they were children to settle their differences. In fact, here's a video of the unboxing. After all, if his sons were to grow up to take over the empire, they would have to be tough. How tough are you? But little did Fred know that this ultra-competitive upbringing would later rip his sons apart. But in the meantime, Fred was still in charge and his empire was growing by leaps and bounds. By the time World War II was over, Fred had built a massive international conglomerate. They were doing business in 50 different countries. He kept expanding into oil, but he also got into the paper business, the synthetics business, the fertilizer business, and even into banking. And he would use all this influence to fight back against those damn commies. See, money is one thing, but now that Fred had all the money in the world, he wanted real power. So following in his father's footsteps, he got into politics. He became one of the founders of the ultra-conservative John Birch Society, which was a super anti-communist group. They specialized in propagating the fear of a communist takeover in America. They even thought President Eisenhower was a communist agent, even though he was one of the guys that helped win World War II. Fred Cook wasn't a fan of the civil rights movement either. He believed that black people were supporting a communist takeover in America. He predicted that communists would infiltrate the American government, and he feared that a future president of the US would be a secret communist. So yeah, the fears of communism at the time were coursing through his veins. It influenced everything he did, and it would have a massive effect on his sons. When Fred Koch died in 1967, his sons inherited the Koch empire, with Charles and David taking over running the actual company. And these sons would bring the shadiness to a whole new level. The OPEC oil embargo of the 1970s hit Coke hard. At the time, Coke Industries had already invested half a billion dollars in five super tankers that were supposed to be delivering OPEC oil to America. But when the embargo hit, the oil stopped, which meant they were bleeding money every single day. So to try to recoup some of the money, Coke Industries decided to overcharge American customers for oil. But eventually, they would be caught. In 1974, President Ford forced Coke to pay back more than $20 million in rebates and future oil price reductions, which to be fair was pennies for them. But it didn't stop there. In the late 1970s, the federal government was giving out exploration tracts for oil with a lottery system, where you could get a 10-year lease at just $1 an acre if you won the lottery. The idea was to give the would-be oil prospectors the same shot at getting some land like the big players like Coke. But Coke didn't like these odds. So Coke got a bunch of people to place bids on their behalf. If they won, they would transfer the leases over to the Cokes. A clever plan that was busted in 1980, when Coke Industries had to plead guilty to five felonies in federal court, including conspiracy to commit fraud. In the five decades Charles Koch was in charge of the empire, the company was paying out record levels of penalties. Basically, any shady thing they could do, they were probably doing it, including backstabbing their own blood. In 1983, a power struggle ensued with the Koch brothers. In the end, Frederick and Bill were kicked out of Koch Industries, leaving with a severance of $800 million, or $2.3 billion in today's money which all being said is not that bad. But in Frederick and Bill's eyes, they felt ripped off. Everything they worked for, their family's legacy, had been ripped away from them. So Bill decided to fight back. Bill ended up hiring private detectives to look into Charles' wrongdoings, of which there were many. Bill even went as far as to drag Charles to court and to even subpoena his own mother. His mother, by the way, had just had a stroke. Needless to say, the two men have not spoken for decades, not even at their own mother's funeral. In 
the 90s, a coke pipeline exploded, burning two Texas teenagers to death. Investigators found hundreds of holes in the faulty pipeline running near a residential area. Coke Industries only fixed a few dozen. So they were hit with the largest wrongful death judgment of its type in US history, nearly $300 million. Just a year later, Coke Industries had to pay quote the largest fine ever imposed on a company $30 million for more than 300 oil spills the refineries have been responsible for, end quotes. That's 3 million gallons of oil spilled in 6 states. But let's face it, the money they made from these 300 oil spills far exceeded this measly $30 million fine. Fines are just a cost of doing business. And what they don't spill, they steal. As much as 300 million gallons of oil was stolen off of federal lands in the 1980s by the Koch brothers, earning them $230 million in profit according to Bill Koch himself. And he lied about it to regulators 24,000 times. And if that wasn't bad enough, a lot of that oil came off of Native American tribal lands. Why? Because stealing oil from these areas is a lot easier since the government wasn't really watching. And what they don't steal, they pollute. They've dumped oil refining byproducts where they're not supposed to. Or take this paper mill from the paper giant Georgia Pacific, for example. Georgia Pacific is owned by Coke Industries, and they make products like Brownie, Dixie, Angel Soft, and more. But what you may not know is that making paper products is actually a very toxic process. Which is why according to the EPA, this paper mill emits 1.5 million pounds of toxic chemicals every single year, including formaldehyde and chloroform. All this toxic waste for a small working class town of just 5,200 residents. The rivers are smelly, the air is smelly, quote, when the wind is blowing the wrong way, it brings a harsh metallic smell into the homes of nearby residents. A strong whiff stings the nose and burns the throat and lungs, end quotes. According to residents, many locals have died of cancer, and the pollution just keeps on flowing. According to the University of Massachusetts Amherst, the three worst air polluters in America are ExxonMobil, American Electric Power, and you guessed it, Coke Industries. Coke Industries dumps more pollution into the nation's waterways than General Electric and International Paper combined, which probably explains why they're constantly throwing money at politicians. Many rich people donate to politicians, but the Kochs? They've created their own political group called Americans for Prosperity, or AFP, which is ironic given all the misery they've caused. AFP is one of the most influential American conservative organizations, but they're actually very libertarian. They're against wasteful government spending, corporate handouts, which I support, but they also push the stuff you would expect, like things that favor their pollution. But the Koch dynasty does not stop there. No, every year the Koch brothers host an annual meeting with only the most rich and powerful. Think of it as kind of like their own version of Davos or the WEF. They gather 400 to 450 super rich people. These people include at least 18 billionaires. One researcher estimates that the net worth of these people comes out to over $200 billion. Take for example in 2014, when the Koch brothers hosted their annual summer seminar in Dana Point, California, at a super swanky St. Regis resort. Security was tight, attendees had escorts from Koch Industries, and everyone had to give up their mobile phones. Some sources said there might have been 300 billionaires there, which would have been over half the number of billionaires in the country back then. So what does the Koch dynasty have in store for us next? Well, with the biggest election year coming up in 2024, you can bet that they're hard at work trying to pull the strings, with one of their main goals being to ensure that Trump does not get the nomination. 